Welcome to Exploring A Course in Miracles. I'm Robert Perry, here with the Executive Director of the Circle of Atonement, Emily Perry. This podcast is a bit of a departure, which is why I'm the one introducing it. If you've watched or listened, you know it's usually Emily doing that. But Emily, you sent me a photo recently from your past in Mindful Leadership that we had a great time with and which we'll show in a minute. And I said we should do a podcast about your professional journey. Not to showcase you, though I do think you deserve that, but rather because it contains some important truths that I think apply to all of us. The big truth I want to focus on is the importance of saying yes. I've been on the spiritual path for 45 years now. And in that time, I've been a big believer in the fact that God really does have a plan. Some dramatic things happened fairly early in my spiritual journey that convinced me that the whole concept of God's plan is real. There really is a plan. And for a very long time, I just assumed that if something was God's plan, it would more or less happen that way. I did believe in free will, but I thought that if you, with your free will, if you didn't say yes to the plan, you'd get like bumped onto plan plan B, which was just like a milder version of plan A, not quite as good. But having seen a great many people over the years be apparently called, it's been very slowly dawning on me that I think most people say no. That felt like a very radical thought to me. And it took me a really long time to let it in because no one thinks they've said no. Right? There's always a story in which they basically said yes. But a couple of years ago, I was listening to Lorna Byrne, who I refer to sometimes. She's the author of Angels in My Hair, and she's been apparently seeing and communicating with angels 24-7 since birth. Got a million amazing stories. She's really mild-mannered, very loving and gentle, but she said the same thing. She said that when people, this is, I think, based on her interactions with the angels, if we are willing to accept something like that, she said that when people are called, most say no. And that shocked me. I hadn't heard anyone say that, and yet it's what my own experience had been very slowly teaching me. And quite naturally, it reminded me of that line from A Course in Miracles that says, All are called, but few choose to listen. I'd not ever really thought hard about the implications of that. But I think when you do choose to listen, you make a difference. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So first, I want to, at least for those who are watching this, put that photo on the screen. We can just talk about it for a minute here. I didn't realize that sharing that photo with you was going to result in this. And had I known, I probably wouldn't have sent it. (laughs) Yeah, this is probably not going to be entirely comfortable for you. But I think the lesson is really priceless. Anyway, so here's what you shared with me. I don't know from how many years ago this was, probably good 10, 12 years ago. Yeah, this is 2013, 14. Okay. Okay. And I and, shared it with you to pick fun at it, <laughs> which I knew you would naturally do. Which completely worked. Okay. Because what this, this like just screams like almost like conventional influencer persona. You know, it says Emily Bennington, lead big, love the journey. And I've endlessly made fun of your pose here in this photo over the years because I've seen that photo before. Because you're you're in your business suit. You're you're so confident, like you've got that look of the confident, self possessed business leader. But you're not just a normal business leader. 
you're in your yoga pose, you're in full Lotus. So you've got, you're a tough minded business person, but you're spiritual too. The whole, the whole vibe of this is like ready to be calmer, happier, stronger, and more centered. Let's go. I'm in. <laughs> Grab your free leadership masterclass plus okay, that's enough. <laughs> updates. Anyway, so we just had a blast with this, um, which you were really in with when we did this privately. Um, <laughs> And and what it brought up for me is I don't know if you want to say any more about all that, but what it brought no, up. No, I for think me, you've said it all. Thanks. Yeah, I said enough. I could keep going, but it what it brought up for me is just how like profoundly your whole professional journey has changed. Like it's it's transformed in those ten years. So. You were going along really well back in those days. And then you took a huge left turn, which is going to be really the focus of our conversation. So let's start at the beginning of that. Let's talk about the earlier parts of your professional life before that big left turn. I want to do this very, very quickly because essentially this podcast is, as Robert's saying, not about my journey. It's just about what my journey can show and demonstrate about the spiritual journey in general. But I do think some table setting is important and I'll be very quick. So I graduated from college in 99 and really wanted to move to New York City where I had an apartment and roommates who were waiting for me but I had spent a year studying abroad in London in college and I'd racked up about $10,000 in credit card debt and I needed to pay that back before I moved to New York. So I moved home, wanted to get a job at a marketing agency, couldn't find one. So I went to a temp agency and said I wanted to work for a marketing firm. They said they didn't have any marketing jobs open, but I should come down and take a test anyway and they'd see if they could place me. Literally, while I was sitting there taking the test, a marketing firm called and said they needed somebody to start the next day. So I was hired as the person who answers the phone. But two weeks and four days later, I was promoted to account coordinator because I worked really hard. After nine months as account coordinator, I pressured my boss, Skip, for a promotion and a raise. And he agreed to give me a performance review, even though I hadn't been working there for a year. And in that performance review, he said, I would love to promote you, Emily, and give you a raise. I think your technical skills are really good. The problem is no one on the team respects you. And so I said, OK, um, I'm willing to learn what it is that I need to learn about the interpersonal dynamics around here. But um, I, I'd like you to help me. And so he agreed to help me. I followed him around for two years with a notebook. At the end of that process, I had a big fat notebook of tools for new grads on how to succeed at work. And I said to him, we should publish this. Long story short, we did. It was a book called Effective Immediately, How to Fit in, Stand Out, and Move Up at Your First Real Job that we published in 2010 by Random House. Um, to promote that book, I started speaking in corporations and on college campuses. And at the end of my presentations, a funny thing happened. The men would leave, but the women would literally line up to ask me questions. And the women were hurting in very particular ways. And so was I. So at the time, I was a mess in my own head to the point where pivotal, pivotally, one morning, my I was taking my children to school. They were six and, and five at the time, roughly. And my oldest, I was very angry this morning. And I remember like jerking the car in reverse and like trying to speed out of the driveway. And I noticed my oldest was crying, but it wasn't like the wailing kind of cry that you're used to from kids around that age. It was just like silent tears streaming down his face. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, mommy, you make me sad. And so at that point, I turned around and I was like, grab my hands and I'll never forget it because they, their hands were so small at that time. And they just grabbed the tiny little tips of my fingers. And I said, I understand something's wrong with me. I'm going to fix it. I promise you I'm going to fix it. So this was January of um, 2011. 
And very quickly after that, the course came into my life. So that was January. I found the course in March of that year. That's a whole other story. But at this time, I knew that I was going to write a book for women because I was so in this space of helping women at work. So I published Who Says It's a Man's World? A Girl's Guide to Corporate Domination. This was 2013. I was coaching women at this time, and I quickly realized that women who were coming to me ostensibly for leadership coaching once they came through the door, their problems were a lot deeper. So they had been diagnosed with a disease, their spouse had betrayed them, their children were on drugs, and so forth. And I couldn't help them unless I started to bring in spiritual tools. So at this point, I was a course student. And so I started sharing course teachings with them. But I wasn't outing myself as a course student at this time, I was just sharing the tools and it was working for them. So I was kind of sharing, beginning to teach the course, but not calling it the course, but the course was very much in my uh, foundation at that point. And you, at that point, you were avowedly teaching mindfulness, right? I was, yes. I was a mindful leadership coach, as you love to point out from that photo where I'm in a business suit, but I'm in a lotus pose that nice combo between being <laughs> mindful and being professional. Yeah. You know, my, I was teaching mindfulness. <laughs> my favorite photo of you. Um, okay. So what happened after you found the course? So I looked this up this morning and I looked up when I purchased the course in miracles and it was August of 2011. And when it showed up, it showed up in a Amazon box with, an intro booklet written by one Robert Perry. So little did I know at that point how much the course and Robert were going to change my life. But when I picked up the course, I immediately knew it was true. I took it out of the box. I had no question in my mind that this was going to be my path for life, even though I didn't know what it said. So, um, so often we hear from students that they pick up the course and they put it away for many years and they pick it up again. They have the seesaw with it. I never did. I knew immediately that it was for me. And I started reading it very seriously. And then around January of 2014, um, something again, super pivotal happened in my life. And I don't talk about this much. You always want me to talk about it, but I never really do. Um, I was standing in my kitchen and I heard this super loud thunderbolt clap, except you would think that that kind of thunderclap would hurt. It was loud, but it didn't hurt at all. And it said, teach really loud in my head, just one word. Um, and then when I would close my eyes and I would see this bright purple pulsating light. And so this would happen to me again and again. I would hear teach really loud in my head, always one word. And then I would see the pulsing purple light whenever I would close my eyes. And so at that point, I knew, I mean, this, I'd never had any experience like that before and I've never had anything like that since. I knew God was coming for my career. I knew what it meant. I knew I was supposed to teach A Course in Miracles. But at this point, I was gaining popularity as a mindfulness teacher. And I was happy doing that work. I felt like that work was meaningful. And I didn't want to derail that career. So I wrestled with it just for a few months, though, because um, I knew it was real. It just felt so big in my head, and it wouldn't go away. It just kept knocking. And so in one of those teary, classic, almost cliche bathroom floor stories, I just, after a few months of hearing this booming voice and seeing the purple light, I surrendered and I said, okay, God, I know you want my career. It's yours. Take it, do with it, whatever you feel needs to happen. And so 
I, I don't know if you want me to like go on from there, if you want me to stop there, but that was big. Well, maybe we can pause for a bit because that's really the pivot of the whole story. So something that nobody else could hear or see, you know, we're not talking about some story that plays out in the outside. You just hear this booming voice and see a purple light associated with it. And you know what it means somehow, which is odd because it's just one word. You'd never experienced anything like that before, but it was authoritative enough that you decided to say yes yeah. and change your career. Now, I know that people, it, again, it's it's like what I said about when the course arrived. I know so many people have all this wrestling with, is the course going to be their path? I knew it was going to be my path. When I heard teach in purple light, I knew that it was about my career and I had about, you kind of laugh about this because people wrestle with this for years when they're called, but I had about four or five months of just really like wrestling with it, but it wouldn't leave my head. Like I knew it, this wasn't going to stop until I said yes. But what I started to do in that time of wrestling was try and make deals with God. Mm. And I would say to him, okay, I will teach the course. I promise. Just let me call it mindfulness because I was having success doing that. I was coaching women, sharing course principles. If they wanted to go deeper, I was saying it was a course in miracles, but I wasn't loud about that publicly. And so I was trying to make a deal with God, but he wouldn't let me do it. He still kept coming in with the teach in purple light. And so finally I just gave up after a few months. So the fact, I mean, it's true that a few months is like a joke. It took me like 10 years, literally. Um, but as I'm hearing this, the fact that it wouldn't stop meant to you that your compromise solution wasn't sufficient. Right. So I would say, okay, God, I'll teach the course. Just let me call it mindfulness. I can speak on stages to hundreds of people at a time that's good enough, right? If I'm still, if I'm sharing spiritual truth and it's still, it, it wasn't even like wrestling or bargaining with me. It was just like teach, you know, like all the ways that I was squirming, it was like teach, teach, teach. And so then I was like, okay. And I started a study group, of course, in miracle. Well, study before, group. before you go on, just, just sorry to interrupt, but, yeah. but when you finally did your bathroom floor moment and caved, what happened to that voice? It went away. It went away immediately. The purple light has never left me. Um, I don't see it all the time, but if I'm in a really good meditation, it will come. And I actually consider that to be the sign of a good meditation. And also, interestingly, if I'm having like a, a holy moment, holy encounter, a holy instant, I'll see shades of purple around it, but nothing like what happened in 2014. So when, when you were bargaining, it kept repeating. And when you finally caved in, it stopped. Stopped. And I haven't heard it since. Hmm. I really appreciate, just as an aside, you telling it as straight as you've just done, because I've been trying to get you for years to, to, to do that. So I feel like you've done it. Is there anything that you're holding back on here? No, but you you have been trying to get me to tell that story for a long time. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for doing that. So you were saying um, you started a study group. And did you make any kind of announcements around your decision? Yes. So I had at this point, this was back in the day when everyone who was doing any kind of online influencer work had a blog. And so I had a mailing list and a blog and I sent a email and a blog post that said, okay, guys, I'm talking about God now. And how do you feel about that? Are you okay with it? And a lot of people left. A lot of people said, no, thanks. I'm not here to talk about God. But some people stayed. And so that was the beginning. I just said, okay, we're going to talk about God now. I started a study group to share the course at my local Unity Church. And then I just kind of did what I do. I knew my next step was to write a book about well, can the we, course. Can we just interject a little bit here? Because what, you know, 
what people I think don't know about you in Course in Miracles circles is you had enjoyed a lot of conventional success. I mean, you had been on CNN, you've been on ABC, you've been on Fox, you were at the beginning of this whole mindfulness wave, which you could have ridden all your live long riding. days. Yeah, mm -hmm. you could have kept riding that. Um, you were at the beginning of the whole onboarding thing. Funny little story that um, I enjoy is that early in our relationship, you mentioned this word onboarding, and I'm like, what kind of phony, made up corporate yeah, word said, is that's I not said, a word? I said, what kind of onboarding does the circle have? And you were like, onboarding? What a bullshit term. <laughs> <laughs> and so you were like, well, look it up. So not knowing that you just laid a trap for me, I looked it up. And sure enough, on YouTube, there's a whole bunch of videos on, on onboarding. And oddly enough, the most popular one by far was yours. And that's still true to this day. I just I just checked today. You still have the most popular YouTube video about onboarding. So that was kind of funny. And around the same time, you told me that you had gotten your first uh, $10,000 speaking engagement, which is a pretty cushy gig. So you had a lot to give up. And do you want to say anything more about the sort of the, the wrestling phase with that? Well, you can see why I was wrestling because I knew I was at the beginning of a wave that was going to be very big. And we all, if you're paying attention to mindfulness, as many people are these days, you can see just how much that wave has gone on. And I was right there at the beginning of it. And so businesses were calling. They wanted, they wanted speakers to talk about mindfulness and I, like you said, I had my first $10,000 speaking engagement. I mean, I, the, the wrestling came from like, are you serious, God? Like right now where, where things are actually taking off. And I actually thought it was like, cause I thought the mindfulness plan was, I thought I was doing what I was supposed to do. So it was like, wait a second, God, I'm already on the plan that I thought you had for my life. And now you just want to completely take me out of it. But at the same time, as I said before, I, it was so real to me, that voice and that light that I was like, I knew it was God. I just knew it. And I also knew that if it was God, I could trust it and that I was going to be taken care of. So there wasn't a lot of wrestling I mean, there was some, but not as much as you're used well, to. Well, good for you. Good because the yes is the hardest part, I think. Anyway, there's a there's a story of a conference that you put in your introduction to your later book, Miracles at Work. That it's a great story, and I'm wondering if you're willing to tell that story. Yeah. So, is as part of the wrestling phase, I and this is documented in the introduction to a book that I wrote called Miracles at Work about course principles applied to career when I was wrestling with, okay, can I teach the course, but call it mindfulness? Can I infuse the work of mindfulness with spirituality? I, that was a big question in my mind. How much were people going to let me do that? So I went to this huge mindfulness conference in DC, 500 plus people there. I was obviously nobody. And so at the q a i raised my hand and i said if mindfulness is a spiritual practice at its root then how much can we infuse business and leadership with spirituality and there was a whole panel of people there i think um tara brock was there a few few other like well name names and known names in this space and it didn't even get to the panel the moderator looked at me and said, business isn't spiritual. Next question, please. Right. Like it was just nobody wanted to talk about spirituality. And the funny thing is, is, is I heard audible gasps, like sighs from people in the audience, like, oh, God, we don't want to talk about spirituality. And then somebody actually tapped me on the shoulder and said, if you put spirituality in business, that means I have to believe in something and I don't want to believe in anything. And I just knew, okay, spirituality in this space is unwelcome. So I'm going to have to 
go all in with the course. Yeah. So you you gave in to, to the directive to teach. You knew that meant teach the course. So what was your next step? I did what I do, which is write books. And so I knew I felt that part of my guidance was to write a book about the course. And this, I think for those of you who've been around the circle for some time, you'll find this piece of the story really interesting. I wanted to write a book. I wrote a proposal for a book called Course Companion, The Essential Guide to A Course in Miracles. And the idea was that I was going to walk them through every section of the text in a way that was like your companion as you go through the book. Now, what's funny about that is that I actually thought I could do that um, being as green as I was at the time. But I did a proposal for that book. I already had an agent, so I was very familiar. I had a name, and so I was familiar with publishing. And so my agent pitched it to Hay House, and they said, well, we've got this book from Alan Cohen coming out called A Course in Miracles Made Easy. This isn't right for us, but Sounds True said yes to me. And they said, we're looking for someone who can talk about A Course in Miracles, and we think you're it. And the problem with this book is that it's going to be too long. It was supposed to be like 65, 70,000 words. They were like, it's too long. And you're unknown in the space of A Course in Miracles. You are known in the space of careers. So we want you to write a book about applying A Course in Miracles to work. That was Sounds True's idea. But the idea was that if that book was successful, then they were going to do more with me with the course. So I was going to be like their course face. And, and that's, and then I guess we'll get to, I wrote that book, Miracles at Work. And I sent it off to get blurbs, to get testimonials from fellow course teachers. Every single person said yes, except for you. And that's where you come <laughs> into the story. So I don't know if you want to pick it up from there. Well, I I did, as I'm sure I've told you, I really wrestled with it and prayed about it. What my issue was, was I just felt there was a lot of Ken Wapnick influence in it. And you were saying a lot, too many things that I felt were way off base for me to endorse. I loved your voice. You know, I love the heart in it. And I believe I, I mean, I haven't looked at my response to you in many years now. I believe I said those things I to you. I still have it. Okay. Just no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I actually do uh, still have it. But <laughs> but I just felt like if I endorse it, I'm endorsing things that are so far off what the course says that I, I couldn't do it. So I wrote you and gave, gave you sort of a polite, you know, thanks but no thanks letter. You did. And just as a kind of, quick and funny aside as well. I was dropping my kids off at school again. And um, <laughs> on my way back, I got the message from you, the email from you. And I, it was the response. And I felt it was so important. That I pulled over, I pulled off the road into a church parking lot only to read this super polite. No. But and and for some reason you you really like telling the story but but the part that i like about it is what happens next and that is you were like oh okay well let's talk i want to find out what i got wrong and we got on a, a skype call i think together and you took a bunch of notes and it was very late in the process but you changed what you could even though it was like all going to to press very soon and you know obviously over the years i've had a bunch of interactions with teachers and writers and i usually you know throw a certain amount of cold water on things and no one had ever come back to me in, in anything remotely like the way that you did really open and curious and upbeat um so that really struck me and then I believe you you asked me to be um, part of your like series of videos for the promotion of the book, right? 
Yes. So after the book came out or when the book was being published, I did a series of interviews with course teachers, you, Bob Rosenthal, Carol Howe, uh, and others. And the idea was if whoever purchased the book would get access to all of these videos. And that's when we had our very first conversation in those videos for the bonus of Miracles at Work. Yeah. So I remember you saying that that conversation had an effect on on you. Okay. So that conversation had a huge effect on me because I, I distinctly remember asking you questions about various things in the course and you would just rattle off where they were in the course. And that was surprising to me that you could do that. And also I felt like your responses in that interview to the questions that I asked were really cogent, really clear and, and impactful. And so I came away from that interview thinking, well, number one, why didn't I know about this guy? And number two, why doesn't anybody know about this guy? (laughs) Um, And so it was from that. I mean, I had done interviews. I mean, I I, I had interviewed Bob, Carol, a few others. And your interview was like, I, I was just thinking, something's wrong here that I didn't know about this before. So I, I started researching the circle of atonement and then I realized, okay, there are some quick and easy fixes to things like your website that I could help with to help the circle become more known. I just saw them in my head very clearly, like I could help them. And so then I came to you and said, you know, if I can volunteer, if, if, if you need help, which you clearly did. Thank you. Um, I remember showing you with a lot of pride, the, the page for our online community at the time, circle course community, and, and the page really emphasized a bunch of different people running different events and groups and so on. And I thought it was great. And you were like, no, I can't support that. Um, and then another thing was that what was very important, I think, in the process was that the CE had not gone off to press yet, and it was a very closely guarded secret. A lot of people knew, but all of them were sworn to secrecy. Whenever a hole happened, I'd chase it down and plug the hole. And like it was a very closely guarded secret. So I told you about the CE the complete and annotated edition. And you immediately grasped the significance of it and the rightness of the concept, which in my experience was pretty rare. Um, And you wrote something about it. And I think we even used, we used what you said until we couldn't anymore because eventually you were kind of inside the circle and it was, you know, it's It's being paid. (laughs) Yeah, right. Um, (laughs) Which made the endorsement seem a little weird. (laughs) <laughs> but so what happened what happened after the whole thing with miracles at work was that slowly we were in more and more communication you 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 helped us out with promotion of the CE and then on January 1st of the following year 2017 you and I started going through the text of the CE together um which was coming out in just a few weeks and then interestingly um I don't know what significance to ascribe to this, but it was striking. This The CE, we've been taking orders for months. We had about 500 orders, I think. And they were waiting um, on the books arriving at Amazon so that Amazon could ship out those 500 orders. And oddly enough, the very first order they shipped out randomly was yours, because I'm getting emails about the orders being shipped out, a whole avalanche of emails very first one they shipped out was was yours and and so in that time you and i are communicating daily about section by section of the text because i felt like you needed some grounding (laughs) before you were to write i had said to you i'm going to write this book course companion and i'm going to take people through the text and you were like 
okay. Um, the language that you used was you're trying to give people a tour of a country you haven't visited. Because at that point, I was going to take them through the CE. And so much of what's new in the CE is in those first chapters. And so you were like, let's go through them together. And then at the end of the process, you can write your study guide. And so that's how we initially started going through right. the CE together. Right. And then in the spring of that year, you're still on your track towards writing your your course companion guide through the text. And you started um, a Facebook group called Course Companions. And I feel like at that point, you were new in the community. There was a bit of a vibe around the, like the new girl. You had like 2,000 people sign up to your Facebook group practically instantly in, I think, a couple days or so. Um, and so you started that community. And then as time went on, you started you suddenly, I think, or suddenly or slowly decided that the Circles community needed to become a whole new thing. And so on your own time, you started building a new community online for us called Course Companions and following the model that you had been pursuing of taking people step by step through every section of the text and then through all the rest of the course as well. I don't think people realize how much that was your brainchild going back to well before you ever got in contact with us. Yeah. So a couple of funny things about that beginning of 2017. One is that I started Course Companions Facebook group like, so all of Course Companions started as this tiny little Facebook group. And I started it originally because I wanted to walk this group through the text so that I could write the study guide. I think I got to like Miracle Principle 6 before I was like, Robert, <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> like, you've got to help me take these people through the text. Because at that point, I got 2000 people in this group, because I made them this big promise that I was gonna take them through the text. And I was like, I can't do it. And so then you had to come in and help. And in the process of coming in and helping, you started to realize, oh, okay, this course companions group can be an arm of the circle. And originally that was all it was. I was a volunteer of course, companions group was an arm. And then I kept like saying to you, like, we can make this part of the circle. We can do this. Like we can bring it in and make it a program. We can make it a program. And um, I was like, we need to form a community. And you were like, no, 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 no. And then I remember there's one email where I finally, I made you this big pitch. And at the very end of it, you said, okay, sweet companion, let's build a community. And the rest was course companion. Yeah. I, I guess we were both thinking we're going to proceed on these separate tracks and it, it just was less and less that way over time until it wasn't that way at all. And then by the end of that year, you were the executive director of the circle, which is not some, you know, in name only position. You are really the director. I took over been. as executive director in March of 2018. So. Okay. Well, I, the idea I remember happened around the very end of 2017, beginning of 2018. I think it was office manager that you offered me and I said, no. Yeah. Yeah. You had your own ideas. Yeah. <laughs> but thank God. Anyway. So looking back on that whole journey um, and now you've been, you've been in harness in that position for over four, like five and a half years now. Um what I see is your professional path going along really well and then taking this bizarre left turn so that it's completely different now than it was. And I want to look at the before and after picture. Um, of course, everything pivoting on you hearing the booming voice teach. And we, you and I see five pretty clear ways, very marked in which it's different now than it was before. And I want to just go through those ways and see what comments you have about those. Okay. So number one, on the level of success, 
you had so much success. You had lots of exposure. You know, you're appearing on major TV outlets. Um, you had a lot of financial success. There was a very clear path forward for you. Not a lot of mystery of how to keep being more successful. There was a certain ease to it. And now that you're over here, there's less success. You're, you, the organization you direct is more obscure. There's less financial success. There's not clear path forward. We are exploring new paths forward like practically every day. It's hard. That's number one. Number two is that before you were really part of this wider world that included various, you know, speakers, thought leaders, uh, corporations. You did work for lots of, you know, large corporations like Microsoft. Um, there were media outlets. It was kind of a whole large network. And now that you're here, on that level, you're fairly isolated. There's not much of a wider world. The course community is very small. There's not a whole lot going on there. We've even ceased having community-wide conferences, you know, since the pandemic started. So there's there's just not that wider world. Certainly not a world plugged into media outlets and major corporations. Um, number three, you were what you often call a solopreneur you were emilybennington.com. Uh, and now your life is really characterized by joining with others in a common purpose. You're leading an organization. You have a partner in that work. There's so much joining. And to me, it feels like you were made for that kind of a role. But before, someone would think you're a natural solopreneur. So going from solo to joining. Number four, there was some meaning and purpose before, for sure. The world needs more mindfulness. Women need help in moving into leadership. You know, you were doing a number of things. There's the onboarding, the mentoring. Um, all those things had meaning and purpose. But I feel like now it's hard to get more meaningful and purposeful. Like we believe this really is Jesus. We believe we're helping ground his tradition, his second appearance in the world, we are we are trying to take in, understand, and extend a body of teachings that just see everything differently in ways that no one ever has. So there's a huge amount of meaning and purpose there. And then number five, before it was self-directed, right? You were thinking, I want to be this. I'll go into this field. I'll go into that field. And now you know that you're called by God. It's hard to have lived through that story that you did and not think something beyond me called me and changed my trajectory. And also, of course, we are very guidance-based. We seek guidance all the time. We feel we have a lot of solid guidance that's not just our own thoughts that really is coming to us. So the whole thing now is not self-directed. You feel like you are carrying out through guidance, a true calling from God. So the before and after picture, it's not just all like black and white. There's yeah. some really great stuff about the before picture, but the pictures are very different. I just want to know if you have any thoughts about all that. I do. Of course I do. So I think the temptation in a podcast like this to say, God knocked on the door, God entered my life and and I said, yes, means that, okay, everything worked out from that point on. And I think the, the real story, at least my real story, is that it got harder from that point on. And that's what people are afraid of. That's why we're afraid to say yes. It did get harder, but it got better. So I have never been happier, even though it's not as easy as what it was before. Um, and, and I want to share a couple of, of examples. You've shared some great examples of the ways in which it's, it's not been as easy, but um, the two things when you say yes, at least from, from my experience, one is um, 
my neighbor, I just moved into this townhouse a couple of years ago and I'm sitting on the porch with my sister and my neighbor comes over and he goes, I, I yeah, we don't have a couple conversations before that, but um, he comes over and he's like, I had the weirdest thing happen. I was on a plane and the girl next to me was reading a book and I swear, I thought it was your face on the back of it. And I was said, yeah, probably I wrote this book. Blah, blah. And he was like, wow, that's so great. Cut to a couple of weeks later, I see him and he's like super standoffish. Same guy who was like mega impressed before. He's super standoffish. And I, I was talking to a friend of mine and I was like, he Googled me. He Googled me and he, he sees that I'm talking about Jesus now. And that's just one example of the ways in which when you say yes to this work, you enter into this kind of odd space where you things shed in your life, you do realize who your real friends are, because I have had a whole shedding of friends who loved to be around me when I was like Emily Bennington on CNN, who want very little to do with Emily Bennington at the circle talking about Jesus. So that's number one. People don't say yes because they're afraid of the reaction from other people. I'm here to tell you that reaction does happen. And then another thing is since I've been at the circle and the circle's ethos is fidelity to the course. I have noticed when I'm sharing just straight course principles, forgiveness is unconditional. Straight course principle. Other people who get mad at that message, who think that, you know, that's just a reason for people to go on with their abusing ways, that kind of thing. They, they, get mad at the message and they take it out on the messenger. And so I've lost a lot in the process of doing this work. And so it's smaller, it's harder, but at the same time, it is so much more meaningful and it's so much deeper. Before in so many for decades, I had this like super restless feeling like nothing, nothing would, would calm this restlessness. I was always wanting to get to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Ever since I said yes to God on the bathroom floor, not only did the booming voice go away, but the restlessness went away. It was just like, okay. And I've, I've, it, that has never come back either. So it's, I'm here to tell you, when you say yes, it's hard. It can be hard. I hope for others who say yes, it's easier. But I don't want to set up the expectation that it's going to be easy. What I want to say about it is that at the end of the day, if it is God, you can trust it. Your life will work out. You will be taken care of, even if it doesn't look like you thought it would. Now. Just to soften it all a bit more, I think it's important to point out that through a guidance experience you had, you came to believe that the original plan for your life was to keep going along the path you were on, to keep going along that easier, more successful, more high <laughs> yeah. profile path. And you felt you were pulled off that track. So is there anything from that guidance experience that you feel you can share? Well, um, it's personal. Do you? I mean, it's about you. Well, we can always we can always edit it out afterwards. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Go ahead. Just go ahead. Let 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 her loose. So I had what I consider to be a super powerful and very real guidance experience. I I'm not one of those people who has these things all the time. And so when I have them, they're really profound and, and I remember it all. And in this guidance experience, I saw myself on a track on a, on a track of teaching mindfulness. My life was going along the way that it actually was. And I got pulled off that track because you fell down and, and, the sense that I got in that guidance was that you and I knew each other, had known each other for a long time, soul family, 
but I was rooting for you in the life that you were in. And, and yet something in my soul saw that you had fallen, that you weren't going to make it in what you were here to do, not only for the course and the circle, but you personally were not going to make it. And so I was called off my track to come and help you on your track. And, um, and I, I mean, I had a whole life on that other track. And so when I asked, what about the people in this life? The answer that I got was very clear. And it was, you needed me more. And so something in my soul responded to your call and I left the life that I was on and came over to your track to be part of this. Well, I can say that in the year before I first made contact with you, you first made contact with me, I was really thinking, is this whole thing going to work? Like we'd had guidance for so long that we were supposed to help ground this tradition based on the course, people doing the course by the book, right? Seriously, the way it was meant to be done. And I'm just thinking like, it's not happening. It's not happening. Is it ever going to happen? And so, especially with the benefit of your guidance experience, I look back because I was having these thoughts or questions, at least at the time, I look back and think, we weren't going to make it. I wasn't going to make it in what I came here to do. So I can completely accept that guidance. And I think just to close the loop, even if it may be a bit uncomfortable for you, I have to say a few things because you coming to the circle has made all the difference. It's been, it's transformed the circle, your, your presence. I think everyone can kind of see it from the outside. Um, we now get out there in so many ways. Um, but one very concrete worldly measure is that our income has roughly tripled from the time before you came. Um, and I just want to say a few things about your leadership. And, you know, you can maybe just plug your ears if, if you need to. But what I love, among many things, is that you are completely mission driven. You're not about whatever brings the, sh the circle short-term success. You really have your eye way down the road on what brings the course success, how the circle can, can contribute to the course of success. Uh, you have a huge amount of vision and drive. You see all kinds of things that need to be there for the future that I would not see. Um, at the same time, though, you're super cooperative and flexible. You've used that quality to build a really harmonious, productive team here where everyone's pulling in the same direction. And that may not sound like a big achievement, but in my experience for a spiritual organization to have that harmonious team is, is rare and priceless. With my own function, as you well know, you systematically reshaped it. For many, many years, everybody wanted me in the circle to do everything, to be everything. And the fact is, I, I'm not any good at most everything. I have this narrow band that I, that I, you know, where I personally excel. And what you did was you just like took the rest off my shoulders and left me free to do what I can do well. And, and so my picture is you're at the center of all this activity, the team, you're constantly fueling the mission, you're dealing with the financials, you've got your, like an octopus, your, you know, arms and everything. But at the center of all that, you're constantly fueling it with super constructive energy and a very selfless focus. I'm almost done. Don't worry. Um, because you don't make it about you. Somebody with as much drive and ability to succeed as you usually makes it about them. But you bizarrely never ask for credit, even privately. You just seem, I don't know what is, is missing in your brain, but you just don't do that. And so I can really see that I can see we weren't going to make it. 
but I can see that we actually have a shot. I don't know if we will, but we have a shot. I want to say something about that, that list. Um, so often, and this ties to the whole point of this podcast, so often because I was on this trajectory of solopreneurship, people will say to me, why aren't you doing that? Like you, you need to be out there on your own teaching whatever it is that you feel like you have to teach. They'll say to me, you have your own voice. Why are you hiding it at the circle? And, and I've had so many people who, who love me, who have given me that advice. Why are you hiding at the circle? And the answer is because I said yes to something bigger than my own career and bigger than your career. I said yes to the course and to God, I guess in reverse, I said yes to God and the course. And I think that that's the big thing about saying yes, you have to put yourself second and put his plans first and trust that not only will it work out for the things that you need, but that on some level of your own soul, it will work out because it's what you need too. Like I never knew how much I really needed this cause that's bigger than me and how much I really needed you, you know, um, this isn't about us, but at the same time, it's, I said yes to God, it's been hard, but it's also been greater than I could ever have imagined for myself. So in closing, I know we're about out of time, but I basically said or implied earlier that the big message we want to get across or the, that I wanted to get across was the difference it makes when someone says yes. I feel subjectively, I feel I've seen so many no's. And I think when you, it's your prerogative to say no, but when you say no, you leave a hole. Conversely, when you say yes, it makes it, it can make a massive difference in so many lives. And so so just from that standpoint of that theme, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah. The last thing I'll say is that when I've been talking about saying yes in this podcast, I've been kind of framing it as you can trust God to know what you want at a soul level. And I think that's 100% true. But... It's also true for others as well, because when you say yes, you help other people on their journey. When you say yes to God's plan, you can't help but unlock something in yourself that helps other people unlock something in themselves. And that's how it works. And so unless, until and unless you say yes, their journey is hampered, possibly even derailed, right? Because here at the circle, if we didn't say yes, then there are, there's real consequences to that. There are real spiritual journeys that are impacted by us saying yes and by us saying no. And I think that's true for everybody. Yeah. And, and so your yes is not just for you. It's for the people who are waiting for you. Yeah. It's a matter of real consequence. It's not a toy. Well, I think that's a good place to end it, don't you? Yes. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much for consenting to this. This is not the kind of focus that I know you find comfortable, but I really feel like your story says something, it says something important for all of us. So uh, thank you for taking part in this and uh, being a bit on the other side with me uh, being more of the MC this time. And I don't know how to close this off. <laughs> I never do this. Leave it there. Okay. <laughs>